God, you know, uh, this is a crazy time right now. You know, it's like um, I'm here in Jerusalem and um, I'm from Los Angeles originally. And, you know, if you've never been in the middle of a war or have heard of a war or been around it, you know, it's, it's nothing like being in a war. You know, I just remember on uh, Shabbat morning, you know, waking up and I was like, you know, learning in my house. You know, my wife was still sleeping and I hear the siren go off. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? And the only time I remember hearing a siren is that we have a, a day of remembrance here in Israel of, of like the Holocaust survivors. And so I remember hearing a siren then, right? And But other than that, I never really heard a siren. And then right after the siren, I'm like, wait, what's going on? I'm like, is this a test? Like, what's going on? And then after I, boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, whoa, like, that's like, that's like a bomb. That's like a, that's like a bomb, you know, that's something exploded. And so anyway, so I went out with my day, and it wasn't until I got to shul uh, to pray, um, I heard about that there was this crazy thing that happened down in the South. And so since then, it's just been um, a whole crazy experience of sirens and explosions and, 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 and having friends that are being called up, you know, to war, to fight. Um, people that I know, new people that died from the terrorist activity that happened in the south of Israel, and, you, and you're trying to make sense of it, you know? And I remember what it was like being in America, you know, because this is like, this is like what, the third or fourth war with Hamas that Israel's had. And you hear about wars all the time, even what's going on in the Ukraines with, um, with, uh, with, with the Putin regime. And, and you see it, and it's easy to look at war from this very, like, you're watching a movie perspective. It's not really real. You're not really feeling it. You're not really in it. It's no real threat to you, but it's something you can watch and get emotionally charged about one way or another. You choose a side. It's like watching a, a basketball game. You know, you're with Putin or you're with the Ukrainians. You're, you're with Hamas or you're with the Israelis. You know what I mean? Th this is what you're, you're dealing with. And you have all these different ways to, to rationalize, you know, your opinion. And, and being in the middle of the war for the first time in my life, you see how sad that is? Because these are real people's lives. You know, these are real people, these are real young kids that are going to defend their country. You know, and I'll say, you know, being in Israel, I've been living here, this is my eighth year living in Israel, it's like, which is miraculous in itself. But I've got a chance to really learn and get to know the Israeli people. And on multiple levels, secular Israelis, religious Israelis, you know, Haredi, religious, religious Zionists, you know, all different types of different types of people who are Israeli citizens. And I will tell you that the culture here is not a, a culture that of violence. It's not a culture of war, although Israel is surrounded by enemies, right? And, and there's been horrific things that have happened to Jews in Israel. You know, one of my first, you know, like really learning about it I think it was in 1929, obviously I wasn't born, but in Hebron, uh, which is one of my favorite places to travel and spend time at, which is Marat Metpelach, which is the burial place of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Jacob, and, and Leah. And some people even say Adam and Eve is buried there. And it's one of my favorite places to go, it's so holy. But in 1929, there was an Arab uprising and, and, and they basically, the Arabs went in and just massacred Jews, hundreds of Jews on Shabbat while they were in synagogue. And I went to the synagogue that they were at, and they have all these memorials there, this. And actually, I went with uh, my yeshiva there. We went on a, on a trip, and, you know, I was able, they asked me if I wanted to, you know, share a few words of Torah. I got a chance to speak. And later, I really came to realize that it was on the anniversary of um, that um, horrific massacre. And so there's many stories like that throughout Israel. And the sad thing about it, when that massacre happened, the British were in control then, and they didn't even stop the Arabs from coming to massacre the Jews. And, and Israel is based on this story. And there's so many wars, there's so many attacks. But the question is, why are there wars? You know, why, why is there so much conflict here? What is the big deal? Right? Is, there, is it really about territory and land? What's going on? And... You know, coming from, you know, you know, African-American culture, you know, I'm, I'm able to maybe have a unique lens on it, a unique way of looking at it. 
because my my grandparents and great grandparents and great grandparents were, were were minorities in America, and before then, you know, they were brought over to America as slaves, and they were denied so many basic human rights. They weren't allowed to become educated. They weren't allowed to congregate. They weren't even. They weren't allowed to read. And through a lot of different miraculous things happen, they were able to at time to get certain levels of justice applied to them, and they were able to coexist in society. Where today I could you know get a job, I can make money, and I could do these things. But nevertheless, there's still a tremendous amount of racism. There's still a tremendous amount of hate against black people in America, and we see it with so much of. Uh, it really expressed through law enforcement and the criminal justice system and the disproportionate levels of force that are used against African Americans versus other minority groups, or other groups, not minority groups, but other groups. The sentencing of crimes, and no one's justifying crime, but you know the, the prison system, the jail system is supposed to rehabilitate people, not to create a, a lifestyle for people to keep coming in and out. But nevertheless, this is the conditions of America. And when I was in Hebron, and I saw that 97% of Hebron is all Muslim, right? And the point of this talk is not to demonize Muslims. It's not to demonize. It's demonizing radicalism. It's demonizing the faction of people who are connected to hate, who hate Jews. And, and when I was there, I thought about just the Jewish community just wanting to be there. Why? Because they want to be connected to Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, and the holiness of that place. It's a huge part of the tradition of the Jewish people. Adam and Eve, the beginning of humanity, buried right there. And this is whole sections in the book of Genesis that are explaining this relationship between Abraham and the land of Hebron and the whole story and how it builds out. So the people there just want to live there for holiness. It's not a luxury resort. It's not uh, oil refineries there. It's not gold mines. You know, it's not a place of tremendous commerce. They want to be there to be close to the forefathers, which is, is which is an expression of the closeness to God Almighty. And so, three percent of that entire re area is a small little Jewish town, and those are the people that were murdered, and were were eventually moved out of there. And later generations came back, and started to come in and repopulate, and they're still at the same percentage. So it made me think about my great-grandparents when they first started to integrate schools. And you basically have few black kids that were going into all-white schools, but they needed to be escorted by police officers and National Guards just to protect them, to be in a collective group of people that don't believe that they should be there. And this is exactly what I felt when I was walking through Hebron as a black Jew. That in order for me to walk around here, I have to have police protection because the people around here could try to kill me just for being a Jew. It doesn't matter what my skin tone is. As long as I'm wearing this kippah, as long as I'm, I'm there for, for my own religious observance, I could be murdered. So I have to have security military people there protecting me. And this is all throughout Israel. You know, Israel gets a lot of criticism for checkpoints and these things. Every place that there's a checkpoint, there was a prior terrorist action there, attack against Jews. Could you imagine that? Imagine if African Americans had checkpoints for white people in places where black people were lynched, right? In America, it wasn't just lynched. They just didn't lynch a black person. They had lynching parties where they would hang black people and they would have cotton candy there. They would have popcorn. It was, like, it was like a festival. It was like a carnival. Think about this. This is like Hamas, right? And, 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 and this type of experience was what my ancestors grew up in. In coming to Israel, this is exactly what's happening now. In order for Jews to be safe, they have to be protected. Not just from terrorists within the state. All the countries around. Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, all these countries want to destroy people because they're Jewish. So let's dig into that. If you look at the historical context of Jews in the Middle East, 
in order for a Jew to live amongst Muslims, they had to pay a tax. I think it was called a Jesuit. It was a specific tax that they had to pay to live within the Muslim community. So just think about that. Let's unpack that. If I have to pay a specific tax to live, that means that I am subordinate to you, right? You are, you are in a position of power. I'm in a position of being disempowered or beneath you or under your control, right? This is what, I've been, this is what I'm dealing with, right? So now, you can mention it rather. You're right there. This is what I've been dealing with. So now, you little bit. They they mentioned that we had. They sometimes we had to dress differently so that they, we were, we were ob overtly recognized as Jews, like mm -hmm. in the Holocaust mm -hmm. in Arab countries. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed the same rights as them. Mm -hmm. We I think in one place we weren't allowed to ride on horses. Mm -hmm. We had to ride on mules, wow. on donkeys. We're the, we're, we're, the, we're the black. black yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, that's where you're going. Yeah, yeah. I want to give you some more information. That I like that. Right? I like that. I like that. Okay, so this is right from where you left okay. off. I want to give you some more fuel for that. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. So when we talk about this this tax and being subordinate, it's, it's the same type of rules. You know, like in America, more than three black people could not congregate together without having a white person there supervising. Is it was the same way in Arab countries with, with Jews. They couldn't congregate without having uh, uh, some type of authoritative or police or, 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 or a person that was connected to the government overseeing it. They had to be identified as Jews in the same way that they segregated black people and made us live in places that they called ghettos. That's where the whole idea originally comes from, from Jews being segregated from society and being isolated. And in some places, Jews weren't even allowed to even ride horses. They had to ride mules, right? Something below the horse. So in 1948, in 1948 is when Jews said, we are your equal. We are no longer beneath you. We are no longer less than you. We're equal and we're all made equal in the eyes of God. And we deserve to have our own land where we could practice our religion freely. We could have our own laws that are connected to our traditions. And even to make it even better, you could join in. You could live here too. And you could practice Islam. You could practice Christianity. You have Druze that have their spirituality. You could practice it freely. But just don't stop us as Jews from doing that. And so in the same way, that when black people were integrated into schools and they were equals, or at least in that context they were, there was massive hate, death threats, people trying to kill, people trying to stop, murders. Martin Luther King was assassinated and many other civil rights leaders assassinated for wanting to be equal. So take that as a microcosm and expand that to a nation state and surrounded by other nation states that feel the same exact way. This is what you're witnessing. And so these nation states have billions of dollars, tons of money. Qadar is giving over a billion dollars on college campuses to teach their philosophy. And you know what these philosophies are? The minority shouldn't speak. The minority is not equal. And so how do they do it? They manipulate, because obviously America is empathetic to the causes of minorities, whether it's women's, whether it's African Americans, other groups. This is what America's based off of. So what do they do? They created a philosophy where now the minority is seen as the person of tyranny. Basically, they're accusing the people of Israel of being them, and they're publicizing it. And they're putting it everywhere. And so we're sitting there watching it. And I'm, I'm, I'm an African-American. I, I, we are black people. We have some of the biggest hearts. After all the racism and all the lynchings and all the killings and all the murders that happened in America, we've never collectively wanted to act out rage against white people. We never stormed white communities and indiscriminately killed people for revenge. No, we sought solidarity. 
We held them accountable to the principles of America. And we're still treated a certain way. So it's the same thing here in Israel. Israel wants to have solidarity with the entire Middle East. That's what the Abraham Accords were about. That's what this uh, uh, peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. This is what this is. They want peace. They want to do business. They want to have commerce. Now everybody could go to Dubai. This is a revolution that Jews can go into Dubai. There's Jews in Saudi Arabia that were keeping Sukkot, one of our holiest holidays. It was illegal for a Jew to come to Saudi Arabia. This is the ambition of what the Jewish people want. It's not elitism. It's not separatism. It's inclusion. But the enemies are giving a narrative where they're pulling our heartstrings, telling us that the very people who want solidarity with everybody are the aggressors. Look at Hamas. And if you want to understand Hamas, don't just look at Hamas. Look at Hamas, look at Hezbollah, look at the regime in Iran, look at the regime in, in, in Syria. You have to look at ISIS, you have to look at Boko Haram, you got to look at El Shabazz. These groups, along with the Taliban, you have to look at these groups. When America was in Afghanistan, and we pulled out, and the Taliban was going to come back in. We all saw the images of those people running for their lives. They were running for their lives. They were scared. Women were running back into the homes, leaving universities. And they knew that they were going to be murdered. Because Islamic radicalism's biggest opp is oppressing the Muslims more than anyone else in the world. We don't know the voices of Muslims. Look at the women in Iran who were murdered because they don't want to wear a scarf, because they want to listen to, you know, secular music. They want to listen to Beyonce. They want to dance to Jay-Z. They want to watch the Kardashians. They want to just live like lives like we do in America. And they were murdered for that, for wanting to be poets, for wanting to be activists. Thousands, tens of thousands, murdered in Iran, on the streets, cold blood, shot dead, teenagers, just like me and you. I grew up in L.A., has one of the highest populations of Iranians. Their cousins were being murdered in Iran for wanting to have a voice. Syria, Assad, he's gassing the citizens. Young babies, chemical warfares, because they're resisting. This is Syria, Lebanon, Hezbollah murdering thousands of people. Do you know what's happening in Gaza before this whole fight? You think was gruesome happening with the Jews? They're doing that to their own people. Today, last night, they literally shot a rocket at a hospital and blamed it on Israel. When Israel's asking them to evacuate themselves, the innocent citizens that are trapped. What did Hamas do? Said you can't leave. They took car keys. They didn't allow people to leave areas. They were blocking areas. Because they want to utilize them for cannon fodder. So they could be murdered and they could go back to the United Nations and say, look what Israel did to us. Look how many innocent civilians they did. Because they're trying to accuse Israel of being them. That's what's going on. This was going on. In the black community, gang violence is huge. Killing is huge. But you know what it's all based off of? Drugs. Drugs. How did those drugs get in the community? Black people didn't go and work deals with the Colombians, the Mexicans. They didn't lobby in Congress to have weak borders for these drugs and opioids and all these things to get in crack, cocaine to get inside those communities. They didn't control the media companies that glorify people being drug dealers and drug culture, that it's okay to just provide chemicals that are gonna destroy your neighbors and ruin them and ruin families. They didn't do any of that. That was put in that. My great-grandparents weren't selling drugs to each other. 
They were protesting for equality. And the way that they were shut down is like drugs were put in the community right after Martin Luther King. Who did that? Who's painting that story? Who created the movies and, and all the TV shows and all the news that you see black people killing, black people murdering, black people killing, scaring all of white society to justify having a prison industrial complex where there's prisons that are there for profit. Lock as many of them up. Bribing judges. You have to make the parallels of how minorities are treated. And this is not just in these places, but it's all over the world. And so Israel says, we want to defend ourselves. We want to defend ourselves. And they say, you know what? You guys are the terrorists. Black groups, you know what? The police did horrible things to black people, especially my mom's generation. And they created things like the Black Panthers in different groups. And what did they call them? Terrorist. Same exact thing, same exact methodology. So if you look at the news from the lenses of a black person who grew up where the media was manipulated and the media was used to be weaponized against my equality and my progression, you can't turn off those lenses when you look over here in the Middle East. It's 9 million Jews here. It's 250 million, 300 million Arabs in the Middle East. What's going on? You're going to look at the Jews in that way? They're dominating what? They're oppressing who? The Palestinians who live in Israel are the most educated in the Middle East, have the highest incomes in the Middle East, have the, 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 they have the, the highest, since the 1940, they have the highest birth rate in all of Israel, more than Jews. They're thriving. You go to any hospital here, mostly Muslim doctors. The ones who are being oppressed are the ones who are being controlled by radicalism. And you see it, like we said, with the Taliban, with, 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 with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with the regime in Iran, with the militant groups in Iraq, with, with going on in Syria, all throughout. And they do not want to see peace. Why is this happening now? We're about to do a peace deal with Saudi Arabia. That's going to normalize relationships with Arab countries and Israel all over. And you know what that means? The light that Israel has brought to this region that you can have a democracy, that you could have one of the strongest economies, that you could take a population and, and train them for the biggest technologies and, 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 and bring over some of the greatest firms in America and Britain to come and want and utilize the talent base that's here, that's homegrown here. That could happen anywhere in the Middle East where the next generation of Muslim kids could be focusing on being scientists, creating solutions, fixing diseases, creating new technology, flying cars, getting rid of cancer, all these things. This is what these kids could be focused on. And what are they being taught? How to be martyrs. How to, how to think that going, dying, and, 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 and dying as a, as a suicide bomber is an accomplishment. That's what you're watching. And again, they don't want you to see Israel. Because if Israel is duplicated in the Middle East, they're all out of business. They're all out of business. And so now they're surviving and they're fighting. So I beg of you to please use the lenses of oppression against minorities on the geographical level, on the economic level, and using the media as a tool to do it. Think about Martin Luther King. Think about the Civil Rights Movement. Think about all the great black leaders that were murdered wanting equality. And take that experience and transplant that over here to the Middle East, a place where people want peace. And it doesn't mean everybody in government is perfect. Government's never perfect. I'm talking about the essence of the people, the essence of their history the essence of leaving Nazi Germany, the essence of leaving oppression in the Middle East, the essence of, of leaving Poland and all these places where they were treated exactly like my people were in their land and said, no, we're gonna create our own country and we demand equality. We have to see the world through those lenses. 
for our humanness. For our humanness. And by doing that, we could create a new era where not only can minorities be equal, but they can prosper and achieve their ultimate potential within the collective of society. Shalom.